Hi, everybody. Welcome back to CDOIQ 2024. We're here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, overlooking the Charles River. Dave Vellante with Paul Gillen. We're getting deep into day two. Melanie Krause is here. She's the Chief Operating Officer of the IRS. Melanie, thanks for making some time. Welcome to the Thank Cube. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So you're a nurse? I am. <laughs> Tell us about it. Wait. <laughs> you know, wait a minute. But you are COO of IRS. You were the Chief Data and Analytics Officer of the IRS, the first ever. H how does that happen? You love data. I do, I do. No, you know, it was an interesting journey, but I would just say I love my profession. And clinical training and then experience as a nurse actually positions a lot of people very nicely for leadership roles. So the, the types of skills that make you an effective leader are the same that make you an effective clinician. So empathy being able to develop rapport quickly, being able to get up to speed quickly, being able to differentiate between what's important and what's really not that important. These are the things that make one a successful leader. And so that has been, I think, what made me competitive for the initial role at IRS and, and helped me to be successful in that capacity. That so, makes sense. Strong with people, you can prioritize, right? You can work well under pressure, right? But but still, <laughs> well, so not a lot of people make that transition. No, so, so that, that's fair. So uh, when I was in my undergraduate program, there was this really strong push to move more nurses into doctoral level programs. So there were you know, opportunities to, as an undergraduate, begin my master's training. And then as I was working as a nurse, to continue on in my doctoral training. And at Wisconsin, you have a lot of flexibility to, you know, with your mentor, determine a program that meets your needs. And so in addition to coursework in nursing, I spent a lot of time in educational psychology. The Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Wisconsin has a great applied quant methods program spent a lot of time with the industrial engineering folks, and it was a great education. But by the time I was ready for my comprehensive candidacy exams, I knew that life in the university probably wasn't right for me at this time. There was a, a push to you know, identify a program of research. You know, what is it that you're going to focus on to build the science? I hate that. For me, variety is the spice of life and I want constant new opportunities to learn something different. And so moving into the government was very interesting to me because it was an opportunity to work on you know, applied program research, to evaluate federally funded programs, to identify opportunities for improvement from a process standpoint, for a cost savings standpoint. So I spent five years at the Government Accountability Office doing just that. And then I moved over to the VA Office of Inspector General. And the transition to IRS was an opportunity to, again, something completely different and to work for this important agency, which is central to funding government programs that we all care about at a really exciting time. So when I started at IRS, we were in the wake of a large data security event. And so they needed somebody who would have a steady hand to work closely with our IT partners, to work closely with the business, to identify very quickly opportunities to mitigate risks to data security in a way that still allowed people to fulfill mission essential activities. We had already a great team. You know, research applied analytics and statistics was a wonderful team to inherit. And so my value proposition was identifying sort of what the key business issues were that the service was facing, how we could plug members of our team into that, where we had gaps in the work underway that we could fulfill you know, additional you know, needs quickly, and then to ensure that we had a person at the table who was thinking about data always, at inception through to the completion of a program. Now, in describing that, you don't talk about analytics. You don't talk about heavy data science knowledge, uh, or the technology. Uh, is that because you had those those resources on staff and what they really needed was a was a guiding hand, not an integrator, uh, not an, uh, a technology person? So they needed somebody who was strong analytically. Again, somebody who understands the, the language, understands the issues. But at that role of the organization, what they needed most was an integrator. And that's, again, back to the, the clinical experience. That's what nurses do mm -hmm. really effectively. 
So uh, have you picked up along the way? I mean, are, are, have you burnished your technology skills along the way, or has that really not been so important to your success? So um, it is, but again, somebody who has, so I have strong training from the University of Wisconsin. I have, I have a, a PhD conferred by the university. Um, I'm married to a person in information technology. I am professionally curious. Uh, and so having a curious mind and then the ability to, again, lift up the people, all the subject matter experts and domain experts who I work with, that for me has been the key to success, more so than trying to be the, the expert in all things. So what are the major analytical uh, projects now underway at the IRS? So good question. So at IRS, we have a pretty long tradition of using data and analytics to support our work. So, and that's frankly a sort of operational you know, mandate. We are responsible for a lot of information. So we received, you know, in fiscal year 23, over 270 million tax returns that we processed. We had more than 60 million taxpayers either call us for help or come into one of our taxpayer assistance centers. And so the volume of information that we were working with requires use of analytics you know, key use of data to drive decisions because with that much work, one can't be successful without a strong technology, strong analytics focus. And so we have for a long time leveraged data to inform case selection. So for compliance activities, you know, being able to quickly differentiate between tax returns that are likely to be uh, compliant with tax laws from those who are not this has also been really fertile ground for the use of artificial intelligence. So we've developed recommender systems that use unsupervised machine learning techniques to identify changes, patterns, that then can be sort of risk scored and then provided to the, the humans, the, the subject matter experts who work with us, who ultimately determine which tax returns will be examined. Um, equally, if not more importantly, we also use analytics and AI to support our taxpayer service activities. So beginning shortly after I joined IRS, and I can't take credit for this, this is work that was underway for years um, before I joined, uh, we began incrementally delivering additional um, bots that help taxpayers to address sort of simple things that they need help with, like establishing an installment agreement which then frees up our, our people answering phones to help taxpayers with more complex issues or those who aren't able to, to negotiate the, the bots. Um, we also use large language models to mine the information we have about calls that come in so that we can identify what the sort of major pain points are for taxpayers. You know, what are the most problematic journeys? You know, which, which taxpayers are having to interact with us multiple times to resolve an issue. What happened? And then what are we going to put in place to address that? And then using the data that we have, have we been successful in fixing those issues? And so we have sort of three main sort of buckets of work in terms of using analytics to support compliance activities, you know, improving services for taxpayers, and then more internally focused process improvements. And, and when did you start in the IRS? October 2021. Okay, so leading up, prior to and leading up to COVID, there was a pretty big brain drain in the yes. IRS. We saw that as, as, as customers. Um, it was, became very frustrating. And the website was, was clunky. And my yeah. accountant used to tell me, just send a paper check. It's, just, it's, it's kind of a nightmare. And then all of a sudden, you guys got this big infusion of funding. I've seen a difference. Um, it's actually I'm quite glad. easy to interact with. The UI still needs some work, but if you're not embarrassed with about your UI, then you're not innovating, so that's okay. <laughs> um, and so we've seen a difference. Um, when I've had, to, the few times I've had to call, I got like really great assistance. I didn't have to call back six or seven or 10 times. Like, I'm so glad. Like, so, so we've started to see that, uh, but, but help us understand from the inside out what's, what's changed. So, and I, I would put in a plug for the session we had earlier today. So there's been some great sessions this week at MIT CDO IQ. Um, earlier today, I had an opportunity to talk about some of that work that is on the horizon and work that's already in flight. 
um, Reza Rashidi, one of our executive directors with Research Applied Analytics and Statistics, and then Maya Bretzius from the Transformation Strategy Office were here to talk about that. Um, but we, we've been very intentional about demonstrating and then communicating the improvements associated with the investment that we received. And so we did publish just a couple of months ago the 2024 Strategic Operating Plan Annual Update. And I think that does a nice job of, of categorizing and describing like what you got from this, what you as a taxpayer got from the last year of money that we invested. The transformation work is helping. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see you know, things that are very mission focused. Uh, there, there's a very deliberate um, effort to show that the newest tranches of enforcement activities that are really centered on the, the higher end, so complex partnerships, um, the work looking at uh, you know, corporate versus personal use of jets. I mean, the, the sort of incremental delivery on the promise to shift our attention to the higher end and the use of analytics to support that work is described in that document. There's also a lot of things on the back end that we've had underway that are maybe a little bit less sparkly, but super important. Um, data security. I mean, data security is and will continue to be my number one priority. <laughs> Uh, and so there have been a lot of activities to strengthen controls. Um, we have been working through opportunities to improve the way that we share data with state and local governments. You know, tax data is really important for establishing whether outreach activities within states and communities to get people into um, you know, the benefits that they're entitled to, whether they're effective. And so moving out on efforts to improve the way that we share data that is you know, compliant with 6103, the, the statutorily required productions for tax data, but still empowers government agencies with the information they need to see at, you know, whether their programs are effective is you know, what we have underway. Can you describe the organization is, is there a CISO reporting into you? The, 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 your previous role reports into you? What, what does that look like? That's, that's a great question. So we recently reorganized. And so we have now a commissioner uh, who's a, a political appointee with Senate confirmation. There is a deputy commissioner. Um, he's Doug O'Donnell, the previous uh, acting commissioner in between um, the, the last commissioner and this commissioner. And then we have four chiefs. And so there is myself, the chief operating officer. I have all of the operational functions with the exception of information technology. So I have research applied analytics and statistics, uh, procurement, human capital, risk, privacy, government liaison, and disclosure. Um, I'm probably forgetting one. Big, big organization. Big, big organizations. <laughs> uh, and then there is the, the chief information officer who is a peer. Um, we have the, the chief tax compliance officer who oversees the main compliance functions, so tax exempt government entities, small business self employed, large business international, return preparer, et cetera. And then um, our largest team is under our chief of taxpayer services. Um, so that's Ken Corbin. Um, the chief tax compliance officer is Heather Malloy. And then the chief information officer is Rishi Bhupal. And the CISO reports into the CIO, is Correct. that right? But okay. we have a very close working relationship. And so on activities related to data security, we've established a, a data security executive steering committee that pulls together the, the key people who oversee and are sort of accountable for different aspects of data security. So there is the chief data analytics officer who presently is chairing it, although it's a, a rotational uh, responsibility. Uh, the chief information security officer, the chief privacy officer, the chief risk officer, they are all on this team that meets frequently to, again, identify in a sort of continuous fashion, like what are we going to tackle? And then to ensure that we are holding each other accountable to dedicating the resources and making progress on what will be an, a never ending quest of maintaining the security of the information that we have and that we have been trusted with, but also ensuring that we are doing so in a manner that sort of allows people to do the important work that they need to do. So for example, a, you know, a CSR, one of our customer service represent representatives, needs to be able to access information from multiple systems on a taxpayer's account quickly. 
So a person calls on, they don't want to be on hold forever. <laughs> they want you to be able to answer their question quickly. And so you know, the ability to seamlessly access those systems, but only what you need, is, is something that I think we all struggle with, which is that sort of tension between data at your fingertips and zero trust principles that we all struggle with. So we talked earlier about last year, you were the chief data and analytics officer here at this conference, CDO IQ 2023. Yes. Um, you were representing that role, I think, this year. Uh, there's now a lot of talk about the chief data and AI officer mm -hmm. sort of coming together. What do you see that's different between this year and last year, and how do you see AI fitting into all this complexity? Yes, so our, uh, our chief data analytics officer is also our responsible AI official. And so for, for us, the roles are, are yeah. inextricably yeah. intertwined. Uh, but again, there's a very close working relationship with the CISO and the CIO. Uh, between last year and this year, I just see progress in delivery. So, so last year, we, we spoke a bit about the high-level ambition, um, some of the work underway to develop stronger uh, governance, guardrails, to ensure that we're using AI in a way that is responsible and is conformant with the, the guidelines and expectations established by the office management and budget. And so this year, you know, I was sitting listening to my, my colleague Reza speak about what we did. So not the framework, but this is how we have done it. You know, here is the approach that we use using data sheets and data cards, and, and here's how we've moved through the, the backlog of production use cases. And, and people were interested in how we use AI, and I could point them to the inventory that is you know, compiled with the other Treasury Bureau use cases and is on Treasury's public-facing website. And then we talked about the the future and Taxpayer 360 and the work that we have underway to, for our customer service representatives, integrate the information from the 9, 10, 11, 12 systems that they currently need to access to be able to answer a taxpayer's question. And the way that we are for this filing season, beginning to leverage generative AI to assist those staff to get quickly to the internal revenue manual guidance that they need to be able to address not just that taxpayer's current issue, but if we believe that there are potentially related issues that aren't on the taxpayer's radar yet, that we can address that with them while they're on this phone call with us instead of having to call back in a couple of weeks when that issue bubbles up too. So, so then there was a question again from the audience, you know, well, when is this gonna happen? And we could say, we are incrementally delivering this filing season and then we will you know, deliver additional functionality next filing season. And that although we're starting with capabilities that are more internally focused for our staff, as we learn, as a learning organization, we can then extend these functionalities to ideally be the, the types of tools that we are providing directly to taxpayers to self-serve where they are comfortable and where they wish to self-serve. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, just, we've been talking a lot to, today about data culture and the difficulty of establishing a culture that's, that where data is central. Where are you in that odyssey? So IRS is different than other organizations, other federal organizations where I've worked in that data and data-driven decision-making is core to how that's we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I think it's really a function of a couple of things. Uh, We've, we have a lot of information that we have to work through in order to be effective. And so, so I think just by necessity, you know, our senior leaders have had to get comfortable with using data long before I joined the service. Also, as a tax administrator, there is a lot of interest in why and how we make decisions. And so I think with that you know, external oversight, there's also a need to a priori think through the facts and the assumptions and the rationale and document the rationale for the decision using facts, using data, to be able to then later explain and then iterate. The um, last question, um, the, the business case for, for the funding that the IRS got was a, seemed like a no-brainer uh, because there's a lot of fluff in the system and you guys are, can now get that in, that's found revenue. If, correct me if I'm wrong, but so obviously it was funded by Congress. Yeah. So it's, it went into law, right? 
So it's, it's administration independent, correct? I mean, your charter, that funding, uh, can you help us understand the, the, the life of that and yep. any risks associated with that? Because it seems to be working. So I love that question. Thank you for asking You're that. Welcome. So uh, we, we were given $80 billion in sort of three buckets, the largest bucket being enforcement dollars. And so those are dollars that we do need to spend on compliance activities. And then smaller buckets for improving services for taxpayers and then operation support, which is a lot of things in, in my universe. Um, and that is 10-year funding. So, so that's exciting. Yeah. Um, but you know, he who giveth taketh <laughs> away. Um, we, we have had uh, two rounds of rescissions, and so um, we we are down to about 60 billion um, at this point for the Inflation Reduction Act investment. And so, that is still a healthy investment, and yeah. we are working to deliver value. And so what we've been doing to sort of demonstrate what we're doing is to try to be very transparent with like the annual updates, showing how much money we spent, you know, in, in broad terms, what we spent it on, and then what you as taxpayers uh, should see. You know, anecdotally here, as well as other meetings, I, I've been hearing like what you shared at the beginning, that it feels better. So in addition to like it feels better to a lot of people, we have examples of the the value that is being delivered through this investment in tax administration. We are also earlier this year we had a white paper that looked at again the business case for investing in, in tax administration. And you're right that a lot of the focus for the Inflation Reduction Act was on revenue generation through compliance. Mm -hmm. And so the way that that works in probably a more complicated way than you would want to get into now oh, is, is uh, it's sort of the marginal revenue to cost. And so you have sort of baseline budget and the, the sort of negotiation is around how much additional, additional revenue uh, you know, would be collected through additional staff. And so it's really focused on compliance activities. Um, however, what we know from decades of research at IRS is that the, you know, the most effective way to sort of fund a country is to support voluntary compliance services. Hmm. You know, most vast, vast, vast majority of taxpayers, they want to get it right. Yeah, absolutely. But the tax code is very complicated. There are people who are taxpayers who don't have great mastery of English. And so there, there's a lot of barriers to being you know, compliant. And so what we're working on now is, is working through what the fact base is for you know, the investment in services to help people to get it right the first time, which we can't as easily fund through enforcement dollars, that this too is really important for the good of government to focus not just on compliance activities, but on you know, lifting up all of us who are trying to get it right. We're also looking at what the, the impact is on you know, technology investments. So what is the business case for investing on, in technology that makes it easier for people to get it right, it makes it easier for them to pay what they, they know that they owe to, again, support good of government, support sound tax administration? Right, and your, your, to your point about marginal cost, you're putting in infrastructure, people, processes, and technology that are going to give you operating leverage yes. down the road. and so. 80 billion or 60 billion can turn into, you know, hopefully 100 billion or 200 billion or yes. you know, whatever it is over time. For the economists yeah. out there, it, it's sort of shifting to, you know, less costly treatment streams, right? And so you're, you're helping people get it right up front. And then for all the people who do have challenges and have compliance issues that we need to address, that you're shifting them from, you know, a, an expensive audit, which is, you know, expensive for us, painful for the taxpayer, to, to things that are sort of a lighter touch where we can get sort of quickly into compliance and then reserve those sort of heavier hitting resources for where we, we truly have a big compliance issue that we need to work through. Yeah, Leverage. outstanding. Well, congratulations yeah. on your career Thank you. and all the fine work you're Thank doing you for, for our, our country. Thank you for your service and um, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you for having me, you, appreciate you it. Bet. Okay, keep it right there. We'll be back with Paul Gillen and Sanjeev Mohan to wrap up CDOIQ 2024. This is Dave Vellante from theCUBE. We'll be right back. <laughs>